Take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading to Ephesians chapter 5, if you would please. Ephesians chapter 5 tonight for our scripture reading. Three verses we'll look at this evening, verses 15, 16, and 17. They're not long verses, very short, so we'll just read them all in unison. Verses 15, 16, and 17 of Ephesians chapter 5. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5. Ready? See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here tonight. Father, I pray that you will continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word tonight. Thank you already for the wonderful music, for the good congregational singing and the choir number. Uh, Lord, it's just been good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Lord, I'm praying you'll bless the special now. May we listen carefully. May you use it to minister to our hearts this evening. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our God measures man by our standard divine. For he sees underneath every outward design. He looks past possessions and costly attire. He studies the heart, every thought and desire. For the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro. We have no secrets that our God doesn't know. Our Father knows our thoughts. He understands every part. Man sees the outside, but God sees the heart. Our God does not judge by how tall we may stand or how much we possess or the rank we command. His gaze goes far deeper to things that endure. He honors the man who keeps his heart pure. For the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro. We have no secrets that our God does not know. Our Father knows our thoughts. He understands every part. Man sees the outside, but God sees the heart. Our Father knows our thoughts, He understands every part. Man sees the outside, but God sees the heart. Boy, that's good. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you now in prayer as we come to open up your word together this evening. Holy Spirit of God, I pray you'll help us as we open up your word and that you will be the teacher, that you will minister the word of God to the hearts of your people this evening. The best we know how, we yield ourselves to you. And I pray, Lord, that what you would like to do in each one of our hearts and lives, you will be able to do. We desire that we see you do great and marvelous things. We desire that we see what we spoke of this morning, that you would be able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. In us and through us. 
And I pray that you'll use the truth that we bring tonight to go on top of that which was brought this morning. That you might be able to do exactly that in each one of our lives and therefore in our church. So minister to us this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. One of the most tragic things, I think, in life is to come down to the home stretch of life or the last quarter of life, if you will, and to come to the realization that you may have wasted your life. Someone said one of the most saddest feelings in all the world is to realize that you've been very successful at that which doesn't matter. Someone said it's sad to climb the ladder of success only to reach the top and realize the ladder was leaning against the wrong building. In our text this evening, if you look at Ephesians 5, the Bible says, See then that ye walk circumspectly. Now he's talking to those who are following God. He's talking to you and me this evening. That you walk circumspectly. That word circumspectly is, of course, is to be aware, it's to be on the lookout. It really means to be careful. Walk carefully. Be aware of what's going on around you. Don't be careless in the way you live. In other words, God's telling us, as followers of Jesus Christ, we don't just drift through life. We don't just take things as it comes. We, we redeem the time, verse 16, because the days are evil. We buy up the time. We, we make the most of the opportunities. That's why he said, it says in verse 17, Therefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Buy up those opportunities and be aware, be wise as to what God wants you to do. Be wise as to how God wants you to live. Be wise as to the will of God for your life. Understand the will of God. The will of God is not intended to be something that God plays keep away from us. And we have to try to figure it out and guess it. No, God, God's will is always revealed in His Word. And so God gave us the Bible so we might understand what His will is. Now we understand that we were saved. In fact, we were created for His pleasure. Revelation 4 tells us that that's the purpose of our creation. That's why we need to be saved. Because they that are in the flesh, those that are just in the natural birth, they cannot please God. So without being born again, there's nothing I do that pleases God. In fact, the writer in Isaiah put it this way, all our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags in the sight of God. The, the, any attempt of me as an unsaved person, as a man who's not been born again to try to please God, falls short. I can't do that. But once I'm saved, once I receive Christ as my Savior, and He, he brings my spirit to life, now I can walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now I have the ability to live for the glory of God. Now I have the ability to be able to do that, and so do you. And that's our passion. We're to have a great passion to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. Love God. That's the great passion of the Christian. But then we find out that God places us in a family. He calls it the family of God. He calls it Christian fellowship. We get to grow in our involvement and grow in our fellowship with other believers. We talked about Wednesday night. We get to call on the Lord with them. Or we get to uh, pursue uh, faith and righteousness and charity with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I'm glad we have with them. And so one of the greatest, by the way, one of the greatest pleasures of the Christian life is to belong to a church family. To belong to a fellowship of believers. To, to have others to encourage us and to help us. That's a great pleasure. But then we also realize that we're saved for a purpose, and the purpose, according to Romans 8 and 28, we're called according to His purpose, and that purpose is to be like Jesus Christ. 
See, what's the grand purpose of this thing? We're to be like Christ. We're to allow Him to live in us and through us. That's the, that's the pursuit. The pursuit of your Christian life is not to be better than anybody else. The pursuit of the Christian life is, am I like Christ? God, are you forming your Son in my life? And, and knock away whatever me needs to be knocked out of the way and crucify whatever me needs to be crucified and may Christ be seen in me. That's the great pursuit of the Christian life. And then, of course, we get to give the Gospel to others. That's, our, that's the main priority. The greatest priority of the Christian life is to get the Gospel to a lost and dying world. That's the great commission. And that ought to be the great priority of the Christian. So we come to an understanding of what the will of God is and our, our, our great passion and our great um, uh, pleasure and our great priority and the things that we understand, what God, God wants us to live. But now we have to come to where we make a decision. And I said this morning there's two decisions, there's two questions that every Christian has to come to an answer. The first question is this, will I give God what He wants? Will I give God what He wants? You say, well, pastor, what does God want? God wants your entire life. God wants you. Okay? You know that, that old sign of Uncle Sam, you know, with the finger pointing? You know, He wants you. That's God. God wants you and God wants me. There's not a single verse in the Bible. Are you listening? There's not a single verse in the Bible that says you can be a Christian and then live any old way you want. That's not Bible Christianity. God wants all of you. He doesn't want 10%. He doesn't want 50%. In fact, He doesn't want 99%. He wants all of you and me. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, in your outside and on your inside, which are God's. When we sing... I surrender all. What's that mean? We get a different view of surrender. When you hear that expression, you think, some people think this, I surrender all. I probably ought to surrender those cigarettes to God. I probably shouldn't be smoking. And, and you're right, you shouldn't. Okay? Say, so will cigarettes send me to hell? No. You'll smell like you've been there. But it won't send you to hell. Or we think that if drinking alcohol or being drunk or that's an issue or lusting, we begin to say, okay, I need to give that up. Okay, God, I'll surrender that to you. Or we have a temper. We get upset over the littlest things. We say, okay, God, I'll, I'll surrender that temper to you. I've got to give that up. And we begin to uh, go down the list of things in our life that we say, okay, God, I guess I'll surrender that to you and, and, and I guess I better surrender that to you. But I would submit to you that's not the kind of surrender God's talking about. He's not saying go down the list and pick out some things in your life that uh, you're going to surrender I think he's saying what we want you to do is you have to come to the point where you understand God wants you to surrender. Everything. All of you. Everything that has to do with you. You have to admit we're helpless. How do you get saved? You have to admit you're helpless to save yourself. How do you surrender when you say I'm helpless to live the Christian life on my own? I can't do this. 
And people who struggle, listen to me tonight, you struggle with temper, you struggle with aggravation, you struggle with being unkind, or you struggle with language, or you struggle with cigarettes, or you struggle with some moral sin. Listen, you're struggling because you haven't surrendered you to God. You've been checking things off the list, but you haven't given yourself to God. Are you willing to give God what He wants? When we admit our helplessness, then we surrender. When we give up on us, that's when we surrender. C.S. Lewis said, the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. If that's true, and I believe it is, then we've got to give this everything we got. If, if, hey, if it's not true, then you're wasting your time being in church on Sunday night. It's all or nothing with the Lord. If it isn't true, if this, this book isn't true, if salvation's not true, then what are we doing? If it doesn't demand everything we have, what are we doing? No wonder there's so little impact in the world. No wonder we have so, many, so, so little power in the world and influence in our world. Because we're never really surrendered to Jesus Christ in the first place. The story was told of Napoleon when he was ready to attack a city. And the people came out and said, why should we listen to you? Why should we be afraid of you? Napoleon said, let me show you. And he marched ten of his soldiers and he pointed that direction and they began to march and they marched toward a cliff. And those ten men marched right off the cliff to their death. He called the next group of ten back to him and the people on the inside of the city surrendered. When they saw the dedication of those men that they would obey His orders to their death. They knew they meant business. You see, a lot of Christians want to sit on the fence. Their whole idea is, well, I'll serve God in my spare time. It's like, it's like I got this pie. Okay? It's not pumpkin. But you got a pie. In other words, in that pie chart, you have, well, here's my social life. Here's my family life. Here's my career. Here's my, here's my personal life. And, and here, this sliver right here, that's my spiritual life. Can I help you with something? That's not how life is. There's a pie. And the middle of that pie is God. He has the whole pie. He's number one in your career. He's number one in your personal life. He's number one in your social life. He's number one in your family life. God is everything. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. God wants the whole pie. Turn with me if you will. Keep your finger or paper there and... Ephesians 5, but turn to Deuteronomy 10, would you please? Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10. Fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy 10, notice with me, verse 12. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. <clears throat> notice what he says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God request of thee? It doesn't say request, does it? Are you, are you reading? Are you listening? Oh, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? He's not asking, is He? No, He's requiring. But to fear the Lord thy God, and to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. 
How does God tell us to fear Him and to walk in His ways and to serve Him with all our heart and all our soul? Sounds to me like He wants everything. Everything. All your heart, all your soul. The question is, will you give God what He wants? William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army, and they once asked him to reveal the secret of his success. After some hesitation, tears filled his eyes. And he said, I'll tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I have. Men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus could do with them, on that day, I made up my mind that God could have all of William Booth that there was. J. Wilbur Chapman said to that remark that William Booth made to him, he said, quote, I learned from William Booth that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. Will you give God what He wants? The second question that is before us this evening is will I do what God asks me to do? Will I do what God asks? What is God, what is God asking for? Look at Matthew chapter 6, would you please? Matthew chapter 6, first book of the New Testament. It will be a familiar verse, but I want you to see it. Matthew 6, and I want you to look with me at verse number 24. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Notice he said, no man can serve two masters, and ye cannot. Did he say you should not? He said you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the, an old English word for the modern English word of money. It's impossible to serve God and serve something else. It's impossible to serve God and to serve something else. It's, it's impossible to have two number one priorities in your life. It's impossibility. There are a lot of things that can push God out of first place. God says later in that chapter that we're to seek first the kingdom of God. What is God asking you to do is asking you to put Him first. First place. We let sports, work, play, hobbies, friends, schoolwork, boyfriend or girlfriend, even our own family, to push God out of first place in our life. And he's saying you can't serve God and something else at the same time. He didn't say you, you shouldn't. He said you can't. God said, I want it all. I want you. I want you to be surrendered completely to me. And I want to be totally in charge of your life. That's what God's asking. So the question you have to answer tonight as a Christian is, will I do what God wants? What's going to be first in my life. Building my career. Raising my family. Planning for my retirement. Maintaining my health. Nothing wrong with any of those things, by the way. None of those things are bad things. Those are good things. God approves of them unless they take His place.
in the Ten Commandments, you'll recall God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Whatever is in first place in your life is your God. Whatever is in first place in your life is your God. And God is simply saying, if you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these other things that the Gentiles, the unsaved people are seeking after, God says, I'll add all those things unto you. You just put me first. Put God first. Turn over to Luke chapter 9, would you please? Luke chapter 9, Matthew, Mark, Luke. The Lord is having some people come to Him that desire to follow Him. <clears throat> Notice with me in Luke 9 and verse 57, it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto Him, Lord, I will follow Thee whithersoever Thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first Go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Follow me. Lord, I'll follow you, but first I gotta go, I, I got some things I gotta take care of. I got some things I gotta work on. You know, you can't say, Lord, and me first and follow Jesus Christ. You can't use Lord and me first in the same sentence. It's either God first or it's me first. It can't be both. These fellows, I have had circled in my Bible, me first, me first. If you're saying me first, then He is not your Lord. You have to decide Who's going to be first in your life? Is it you? Or is it God? What are you saying to God tonight that is me first? Well, Lord, I'm going to serve you, but Lord, let me, let me first find somebody to marry. Well, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to serve you. Let me, let me first get myself in a better job. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you, but let me first get my career on the right path. Or let, let me first get my finances in order. It doesn't matter what it is that you're going to put first. Listen, Satan will see to it that he keeps dangling that out in front of you until your life is spent and never do anything for God. So how do you... How do you Put all those things in perspective. You know how you do it? You put God first. When you put Him first, He gives you the right perspective on everything else. But you have to take the first step and put Him first. So I just don't see it. Well, then take it by faith. God wants you to walk by faith, not by sight. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. I'm told that in space, astronauts experience the misery of having no reference point. There's no force that draws them to the center. There's no gravity. And when there's no moral gravity, no, no force that draws us to the center of what's right, then we have spiritual weightlessness. And you know what we do? We just go on our feelings. Feelings that carry us at times to places we're never meant to go. To do things we never should have done or do. 
We get all emotional. We live for emotional experiences. All across the land today, I'm telling you, there are people in church for the emotional experience of it. They want the music and the lights and the beat and all that because it gives them a certain feeling they're looking for. And they live off their emotions. When they say, oh, that, that's, that really ministered to me, what they're really saying is that moved me emotionally. We take emotional experiences and mistake them for spiritual ones. And instead of seriousness, it's foolishness. And instead of gravity and seriousness, it's flippancy. Sentimentality has taken the place of theology. Because we've, we've lost our reference point. A reference point has to be God. What does God say is right? What does God say is not right? Why has is, why is America lost its moral compass? We have nothing drawing us to what does God say is right. Our reference point until we answer God's call is merely ourselves. And when that happens, we cannot possibly tell which end is up. Elizabeth Elliot. Judson Van Deventer was raised in a Christian home. At 17, he accepted Jesus as his Savior. He graduated university with a degree in art, and he was employed successfully as a teacher and administrator of high school art. He traveled extensively, visiting various art galleries throughout Europe. He also studied and taught music. He mastered 13 different instruments, sang, and composed music. Very involved in the music ministry of his church. And soon found himself torn between his successful teaching career and a desire to be part of an evangelistic team. That struggle lasted and tormented him for five years. In 1896, Van Deventer was conducting the music at a church event. And it was during that meeting that he finally surrendered his desires completely to God. And he made the decision to become a full-time evangelist for God. He submitted completely to the will of the Lord. And when he did that, immediately he said a song was born in his heart. That song was put to music by Winfield Whedon. Whedon loved the song so much that he wrote the music for it. He had the words put on his tombstone. And the words on his tombstone are, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. Probably a song that is sung more often by people who don't mean it than any other song. What we really mean is I surrender some or I surrender most. Very few literally mean I surrender all. Now you may be here and say, well, Pastor, what? Why? Why should I make the effort to surrender all? Why should I give God what He wants by putting Him first? Living my life according to His will. 
I'll, I'll answer your question with two words. The cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. The cross. Jesus gave His life completely for me, for you. He gave everything. And Paul said, if you look over in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse number 15, Paul writes these words to the, to the church there at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15. He says, and that He died for all, talking of Christ. Now listen, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. So since He died for me, I cannot live the rest of my time for myself. I'm to live for the One who died for me. He's the One who gave me life. I owe Him everything. So do you. You have to make a daily decision. What's your decision? Will you give God what He wants? Will you do what God says? If you do that, listen, there's, there's no, there is no way for us to fathom what God could do through us as a church. The people that could be reached. The impact on our state of Ohio. Let alone Columbus. But in the state of Ohio, the impact God could do if He just had a group of people that were completely surrendered to Him. To say, Lord, I will give you what you want. Me. And I'll do what you tell me to do. I'll put you first. Friend, that's a rare thing in these days. It's a rare thing in these days. The question each of us have to answer as Christians, will I give God what He wants? Will I do what God wants me to do? Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before You tonight. We thank You, Lord, for Your Word this evening. Lord, I've tried to be faithful to Your Word tonight. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, You've taken the, the, the truth into the hearts of Your people here this evening. And I'm asking You this evening, dear God, that there'd be numbers and numbers of people in this room under the sound of my voice that would say, God, I will give you what you want. I'll put myself on the altar, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you. That's my reasonable service. It's only right. And we'll do what you want us to do. Father, use us for your glory. We want to see you do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. In us and through us. We want to see things happen here in this place. The people would shake their head and say it has to be God. And we want them to think it's all God. It is all God. Glorify Yourself in us and through us. Have Your way in our lives, please. 